Ah. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the CCA Living Room. I'm Jason Silverman. I'm here at the Center for Contemporary Arts in our studio, all alone, feeling lonely without all of you here. Hopefully, someday we will be out of this global pandemic and back to the movie theaters to see wonderful films. Um, I'm really thrilled that we've got um, Eliza Hittman with Never, Rarely, Sometimes, Always, a film that deeply, deeply moved me when I saw it. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, but first, I want to tell you about some upcoming programs. Uh, this Friday, we've got an incredible documentary called The Fight. It's a celebration of the ACLU, which is celebrating its 100th birthday. We've got one of the subjects of the film, Bridget Amari, um, in the program, and Peter Simonson, the head of the ACLU New Mexico, with John Bienvenu moderating. Um, next Tuesday, a very, very special program presented in conjunction with Santa Fe Indian Market and Swaya. It's Zach Kunick and Norm Cohn, who are two absolutely seminal figures in the world of indigenous cinema. The film is One Day in the Life of uh, Noah Piagatuk, and it is just a knockout. Um, Zach and Norm created a film called The Fast Runner, which many of you will remember. Uh, one of the most important uh, films of the last 25 years, uh, really gorgeous, powerful, unforgettable. This film is wonderful too. The following Tuesday, we will be with the amazing actor, director, musician, Gary Farmer. We'll be showing Jim Jarmusch's film, Dead Man, uh, which is a radical retelling of the American West, of the settling of the American West. I really recommend it. That's also in conjunction with Swaya. And on the 28th, a program with the Santa Fe Opera, Unshakable with those who created it. We're gonna show the entire short opera as a part of that presentation. So head out to the CCA website, ccasantafe.org to read these descriptions and sign up for these programs. We have more to announce coming up soon. And thank you for all of your support during this difficult time. Uh, it's been uh, amazing to have this connection and the connection that Santa Fe's cultural institutions are providing. Um, I know we all miss each other, uh, but we really appreciate you being a part of this and supporting your local not-for-profit cultural organizations, social justice organizations, etc. cetera. Uh, we all need you in this time. So thank you for being generous and present. Um, back to never, some, uh, never, rarely, sometimes, always, stumble over the title. Um, I saw this at the first um, screening at Sundance this year, and uh, it was truly a, an experience that rocked me. I think it changed my chemistry. Um, it kind of wrecked the next day or two of film going for me. Uh, it's it's a really rich, deep, um, in a way meticulous film, but it also feels organic. It's, it's really a great work of art. We're very grateful to have Eliza Hittman here with us. She's an award-winning filmmaker um, based in New York City. Her feature film, Beach Rats, which played at the CCA, um, won an award at Sundance. Um, she's been compared to Claire Denis and Lynn Ramsey uh, and uh, was listed as one of Filmmaker Magazine's 25 New Faces of Independent Film uh, and has won numerous awards. We're really grateful to have Eliza Hittman with us. And our moderator tonight is someone who I greatly admire. Mara Fortes is a researcher, curator, author. Uh, she works as the curator at the Telluride Film Festival has programmed for the Ambulante Documentary Film Festival in Mexico uh, and for museums around the world. Uh, so we're very grateful to have you here. I'm gonna turn it over to Mara to set up the program. Thank you guys both for being here. Well, thank you, Jason, for, for the invitation. And um, I always think these uh, online events are like little movies in and of themselves because they are kind of like a montage of time and space and people connecting from um, all over the world. Uh, and it's also very nice to meet you, Eliza. I love your movie. It's uh, incredible. It's also, as many have said, uh, about a very timely subject. And I think this idea about the timely subject, it makes me a little bit depressed about uh, humanity, that we're still debating the autonomy of women, the autonomy of, of their bodies, but your filmmaking restores that faith in humanity and in the power of cinema. So, um, so yeah, and um, on that note, I have to ask you, where are you connecting from? 
I'm, I'm a little embarrassed. I was just having um, internet trouble in uh, upstairs. I'm in my parents' basement. Um, and actually, I'm, I'm very proud of this basement because uh, I shot a lot of my first feature in it. It felt like love. And then it was a production office for Beach Rats, and we edited in it. And then we edited uh, never rarely, sometimes always, in their basement. Um, so I'm embarrassed that it's such a mess behind me, but I'm also happy that the internet is working much better than it was upstairs a few minutes ago. So I apologize for the mess. Wasn't what I was planning. Don't look, don't look. There's an air fryer back there from um, my partner's parents, and I hope they don't ever know that we stashed it down here. Um, Yes, I'm in Brooklyn in my parents' basement. Great. And uh, I mean, now that you mentioned your uh, your first film, I'm actually quite curious about, um, you know, if, if you think about your three films, It's Not Like Love, Beach Rats, and Never Rarely, Sometimes Always, it seems like you're drawn to the headspace mm -hmm. of uh, teenagers or at least people who are in some sort of transition or rehearsing some sort of uh, transition. And I'm just curious, what is it that draws you to these characters? Yeah, I think, you know, I, I accidentally made a loose trilogy of, of portraits um, about young people who are at this very transitional moment in their lives and they're um, on the margins and navigating these sort of complex um, systems around them, you know, of oppression, I guess, and um, patriarchy uh, is the thread between them. I think I think I've always loved films about youth, and I think as a kid, there was always part of me that you know wanted to be an actor. So I was always like very interested in like young performers and films about youth, and um, you know, I guess you know specifically films that explore kind of how painful it is to grow up and that loneliness and, and uh, you know, feeling of alienation, I guess. And, you know, my first feature, It Felt Like Love, was, it was a very micro budget movie. Um, and it was at a time where there were all of these mumblecore films coming out of New York, which focused on, you know, this sort of adolescents after college in New York and I wanted to sort of focus on another side of New York and focus on true adolescence I guess and um, the first one was you know this attempt at making like a micro budget movie that wasn't mumblecore but you know had a similar production model and, and explored you know, sort of the fringes of the city, which I sort of know well, um, and never felt quite comfortable growing up in like Manhattan spaces in the way that those films explore kind of this other Brooklyn and this other kind of Manhattan space. Um, so yeah, I don't know, I'm just, I'm rambling, but that was sort of how it all started. And um, I don't know, you know, I, I think like when I was writing Never Rarely, Sometimes Always, I thought about making it, um, you know, an adult, you know, it could be a woman, it could be anybody, it could be a mother already, you know, who, who can't afford to have other children who's forced to travel for various reasons. But I felt sort of comfortable, I think, in this young space and exploring the obstacles. But it's definitely the last one definitely my last film that explores lost youth. <laughs> and can you talk a little bit about the origins of this particular film? How, mm -hmm. um, how the idea started, how you developed the project? Mm -hmm. um, I started thinking about this film a long time ago, like in, in 2012, when I read about the death of Savita Halapanavar in Ireland. She was a dentist who um, died of blood poisoning when she was denied a life-saving abortion. And I just started reading about the history of the Eighth Amendment in Ireland and became very fascinated 
um, with a book that talked about this underground railroad of women who would travel from Ireland uh, to London across the Irish Sea and back in 24 hours. Um, and it just seemed like for me, you know, like everything that I care about in a film, you know, this sort of subversive hero's journey. Um, so I sort of took that journey and then I explored what it would look like in the United States because I didn't think anyone would give me money in 2013 to make a movie in Ireland. And, you know, people take this journey all over the world. So I felt like it could be easily transposed. And I, I was actually curious um, about the, the journey aspect and also the fact that you are a New Yorker and this film is very mm -hmm. much about these two uh, young women from rural Pennsylvania discovering mm -hmm. New York City. So what was it like for you to kind of get into this outsider's perspective of New York City? I, I, I was curious about that. Um, yeah, I mean, all of my movies, you know, are so unsentimental, you know, that I knew that when these characters are coming into the city, I knew that, you know, there there was nothing romantic about the journey. Um, and I thought a lot about, you know, this character kind of navigating liminal spaces um, from waiting rooms to, you know, bus stop to bus station to waiting room to subway. Um, and that was, in a way, the concept of the film. I, I thought of it always as the movie as being like this sort of bureaucratic odyssey, a poetic odyssey, but very much, you know, we only see her in liminal spaces. So early on, like I, I tend to write on my feet, you know, and I, I took the bus that the character takes. I picked the town where I wanted to set the film and then I took the bus and I, you know, make little video sketches as I go on my phone of just what, what you know, what organically happens in the landscape as I'm on the journey and what feels relevant to the character and what the character would see and notice. And um, I, I like the idea that, you know, per, that, that Port Authority is sort of the only thing they really experience in New York. Um, because they're just there's something safe about it and warm in the winter um, and become it for me as I was writing I sort of always thought of it as this microcosm for the city and what was it like shooting in Port Authority it was it was hell it was total hell um, every time I, I shoot a movie for some reason at the last minute they find out that I like can't actually shoot in the location that I've spent so much time thinking about um, and Port Authority costs a lot of money um, and I didn't know that going into it and we were only allowed to shoot there from like 1 to 4 a.m. You know, they wait for like all of the traffic, all of the commuter traffic to clear out before they give anyone permission. So I was very anxious actually about being able to afford extras to fill the space, to give it the life that I wanted it to have in contrast to the town in Pennsylvania. It was a little worried the whole time. Um, yeah, so it was, not, it was not a fun experience and you can't really like shoot run and gun in Port Authority because you know, there's police stations in it and there's like state troopers there. And it's like, a you know, it's like a central artery of the city, you know, so there's nothing that you could do on the sly. And it all has to be, you know, through this rigor, you know, intensive permission process. And I wanted to ask you, I mean, you know, the, the term neorealism is uh -huh. something that gets attached to your work. Uh, and I wonder what your relationship to that is, because I think, you know, in some ways it means that there's, it, you know, it's a filmmaking that's very descriptive, maybe mm -hmm. descriptive over uh, the weight of like a really clear narrative art. Mm -hmm. But I also find that 
you also have very stylized filmmaking mm -hmm. and um yeah it's funny because i use i always think of my narratives as being more subjective than maybe a neorealist film and i use things like extreme close-ups and slow motion and sometimes a lot of slow motion um and I don't know. I mean, for me, those things feel more stylistic and subjective than you would find in a neorealist film. What do you think? You're the you're the academic. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, I was I was thinking that 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 there's all these sort of variations in the speed, um, and that you really try to inhabit the headspace of these characters. And that you know, I noticed things like in the sound design mm -hmm. uh, that that is also very um, focused on these small gestures. Mm -hmm. and even objects like the weight that objects have uh in this in in this film mm -hmm. um and even you know the i i if i remember correctly like there's moments where there's a more dynamic camera it may be a steady cam are, tend to be in these mm -hmm. very small uh spaces you know yeah. like when she's undergoing this procedure where it's really about mimicking her uh her yeah her subjectivity and her experience of what's going on in that room mm -hmm. that, um do you think would you describe it as neo-realist i don't know i you know i i, I like i would shy away from using those uh -huh. those terms because mm -hmm. i think that it i would it's 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 your style mm -hmm. and um i, I guess like in a fundamental sense you know, neorealism like describes the movement of people, but like, primarily, you know, coping with clashes, class issues, pushing up against, you know, systems that don't benefit them. So, like in a fundamental sense, yeah, like I guess it inhabits the spirit of those movies and, um, you know, speaks directly to those themes. Um, I don't know if stylistically I think of it um as you know i think there's like a little bit more of a playful spirit i guess than trying to create you know a, a you know a documentary like realism mm -hmm. but yet there's there is a faithfulness to kind of location mm -hmm. and um mm -hmm. and 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 i i actually wanted to ask you about um because there's there's also this very detailed journey through the procedure that she's undergoing um mm -hmm. and i was wondering you know both kind of the the research that went into that and also if there was some hesitation that this might scare you know that it might have this effect mm -hmm. of scaring away mm -hmm. women who who are facing that um situation mm -hmm. um, yeah i was really scared about that you know like making something that perpetuated fear or stigmas around the procedure um and i had a lot of you know support from planned parenthood in the process um and particularly from a very special individual named karen sprook who is sort of the a, like kind of created carved out a position for herself as someone who interfaces between Planned Parenthood and like film and television to help improve the representation of um, reproductive rights on screen. And um, she, you know, isn't just, you know, like sort of a mouthpiece for Planned Parenthood. She's a real supporter of artists. And all along, she said to me, she was like, as long as it's true to your story, you know, we're not going to say anything. And that was like a big, you know, that gave me like kind of a big sense of relief because obviously I don't want to do harm, you know, to, you know, everything that they're trying to put out into the world and not scare or deter people. But I think, it, you know, there, it was about the honesty and truthfulness of the character's experience and it is intimidating and it can be lonely. And yet there's, you know, discomfort and a little pain involved in it. Um, that doesn't mean that that should inform your choice, you know, obviously. 
Um, but, you know, I, I, I think that it was about a balance, you know, and knowing, you know, where, you know, how not to go too far, you know, and trying to, you know, always push the boundaries on what I do, but knowing that I make work that kind of exists a little bit in a gray zone always in terms of, you know, provocation. Um, and for me, it was all about what the, when I write a script, it's really like all about what the character is thinking and feeling throughout you know, because we are on these sort of micro journeys with characters going through painful experiences that are tied to their identity. Um, and I didn't want to, you know, you know, I didn't want to go too far and make it like too excruciating, but I felt like, yeah, it's, you know, a big choice she's made and it's a big thing to go through alone and she's anxious. Um, and that was, you know, something that I held on to because I've seen other films, you know, try and overcorrect and it's like, wait, did she get a manicure or an abortion? Like, I'm not really sure. <laughs> you know, like, trying to be so positive, we strip away, you know, the real experience of the human being. Um, and that's really, you know, what I was trying to honor. And I mean, I, you know, of course I thought about other films that deal with the subject and, and mm -hmm. what's also remarkable about, about your film is that the drama is not centered on the making the choice uh -huh. that there's, you know, I thought about the, this ro the Romanian film, uh, Four Months, Three uh -huh. Days, um, where there's clear, you know, there's a clear kind of villain in the sort mm -hmm. of sketchy doctor that performs the abortion. And, and mm -hmm. your film is really powerful because it, beyond the, you know, the, the theme of abortion, it just shows the, um, the toxic atmosphere mm -hmm. that women inhabit on a daily basis. And these, you know, I, I hate, I hate the word microaggression because I never understand when micro becomes actual, like, you know, it's like a, a misnomer, but like you show, you know, just from even uh, how her stepfather acts, mm -hmm. just the, you know, every little sort of tacit aggression that happens in their world. And yeah, I wanted to ask you about how you, you, you came up with, with kind of that atmosphere, that oppressive mm -hmm. atmosphere in, in yeah, well, I was, you know, I thought a lot about the Romanian film too, you know, and it's a movie that's like so masterfully executed, you know, uh, uh, and is, you know, was such an important film, you know, I don't know, in 20, 2006, 2007. Um, but I also found it um, to be a bit shaming of the character who was pregnant and like, you know, the trope of the, um, you know, evil abortion doctor. Um, yeah, I just was sort of thinking about those things and just thinking about like, you know, if, if this film is like a slice of life film, you know, there's nobody trying to stop her, but like the world is trying to stop her. Actually, there's, a you know, a, a million antagonistic forces that are disrupting these journeys every day money you know um getting off work distance you know lack of sex education you know so many people are you know can be in denial you know of these circumstances and push things um, you know, beyond the point where they're able to get an abortion. And I was just thinking about all of those, you know, antagonistic forces that are acting upon this character um, at all times. And, you know, thinking about how to, you know, use these micro moments as sort of, you know, metonymy, I guess, for, you know, for larger moments um or for larger my you know macro obstacles i guess um and it, it was fun in a way to play with them because obviously they're from the character's point of view you know and they're young so all these moments are more heightened 
Um, so there was definitely like a, I would say I came at it with sort of, um, you know, knowing that these like sort of little moments on screen, you know, would be symbolic and representative of, you know, sort of larger issues and about like toxic toxicity towards women. And maybe um, this is a good moment to show the clip. Uh, Jason, if we can show the clip, I think it's called Girls' Problems. I saw you weren't at school today. I went to the doctor. Are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. What's wrong? Girl problems. Bad cramps. Yeah. I saw you weren't at school today. Get those two. I went to the doctor. Run through a bottle of pink. Are you okay? Every month. Yeah, same. Yeah, I'm fine. Don't you What's ever wrong? just wish you were a dude? Girl problems? All the time. Bad cramps. Yeah. I mean, uh, that moment is is really powerful where she just asks, do you ever wish you were a dude? And I think there's all these little moments in the film where you see these aggressions from dudes to the women invading their space. But I was thinking that it's also amazing how you set up this contrast in the kind of choreography of, of attention, like the attention of men towards the women, but also the attention of women towards women and, you know, the, the mom is the one who notices that she's not eating. The friend is the one who notices there's something wrong with her. And so you actually create this um, wordless connection between the women in the film. And, and that's very patent also in the visual language of the film and these very small gestures like the, um, you know, when they hold the pinkies, uh even the when she's playing with the hair band i mean there there's all these very small gestures and i was i was wondering how you do you do you come up is are those part of the of your writing the film or how did they play in the in the mm -hmm. creating they are they're on the page um and i guess um you know i guess like for me like writing a script is a little bit like kind of making a sculpture um and you know a lot of times i go through the first draft and it's like okay just put the story down like just get the story down you know if you can do that much you know you've done so much already and then the next draft for me is very much about the subjectivity you know and, and making sure that there's a clear point of view um to the, the you know the way to reflect the way that i know i want to shoot the film and then the last draft is really like about those details in a way and making sure that they're there and punctuated on the page and carved into the story because um i don't know the work you know for me those like sort of small details resonate um you know like and they're and they're usually moments they usually come from moments where um the dialogue saying what's in the moment doesn't work as dialogue um and then i'm looking for another way around and looking for a way to sort of talk about what's underneath so um you know, like the moment with the rubber bands and the hair and stuff like I had a memory of when I was a kid and my mother had um, breast cancer many times. And I remember sitting in a hospital with my grandfather who always had office rubber bands and he would do that trick to me. And it was in a way it was a subtle way of kind of distracting and it was it was magic in the moment. And then when I was writing that scene and I was just thinking about, you know, how can she help her in this moment when there's so much anxiety about going in to do this final thing, you know, that image of my grandfather like popped into my head and I wrote it in. Um, and then the pinkies moment, you know, it like, 
it wouldn't or in that moment it wouldn't have worked if it's not my movie if she says is there anything i can do to help you through this difficult moment like it wouldn't be the kind of movie that i watch or i'm interested in making and the same thing with the pinky moment you know if they had said you know what um what happens in new york stays in new york you know it's not I'm always looking for a way around those sort of obvious moments where people rely on dialogue to communicate what's happening. And actually, I, you know, there's a, a few questions in the from the audience in the chat about the relationship between the girls and how mm -hmm. there seems to be this, uh, you know, kind of um, maybe not overtly emotional connection between them, um, this kind of wordless interaction. How did you work with the, um, the actresses to, to almost to create that kind of telepathic connection that we feel as watching the film? Or what was, what was kind of your process in working with the actresses? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I think, you know, the movie is very much an independent movie. When you make very independent movies, you know, even though Focus came on, they came on after the movie was shot, if I'm being honest. And, um, uh, you know, there wasn't like a window to rehearse the movie. It all came crashing down on me. And I had two very short days to really only work with the two girls. Um, and... I don't know, it's, you know, it's not an ideal way of doing things. Um, and I don't know, I can't do that again. You know, I need like two weeks to rehearse a movie. Um, and I, I, I basically, I took the two girls alone together away from the production. Like they just came over to my apartment and I gave them each marble notebooks and I wrote like a few writing prompts and they were very personal writing prompts not about their characters things about their families that i knew and things that i knew that they had in common and both of them were a bit estranged from their fathers so i asked questions about their last memory of their father you know happier things too and then i let them write and i just left and I let them share what was in those notebooks together because I wanted them to know each other in a deep and real way as young women, you know, with real things in life in common and real heartbreaks in life in common. And, you know, to have a true bond on screen. And we, you know, we did things like we read the scripts and I answered their questions and we like rehearsed the lines and things like that. But you know, the, the, I think the most essential thing that I did was that exercise because the, the connection that you see on the screen is really, you know, their connection with each other, you know, that gets deeper and deeper as the story goes on. And can you talk a little bit about the titular scene, you know, when she's yeah. talking to the counselor, uh, because it's such a powerful scene and, you know, the questions that go unanswered, mm -hmm. or at, you feel as, or at least I felt, I felt mm -hmm. that, I, you know, I felt the answers. Um, mm -hmm. How, how you, you worked that, that scene? To direct that scene. Um, well, I guess, uh, the woman in the in the scene, I should also let you know, is a real counselor, uh, and she worked. She trained at Planned Parenthood, um, getting her doing her field work for her um, masters, and then she worked at another clinic in another in a different part of New York that wasn't Planned Parenthood. And I met her, uh, and I really like. I responded to her honesty you know, in telling me about the work that she does as an abortion counselor. Um, and I don't know, when I wrote the script, I thought a lot about her in the character. And then I ended up just asking her to do it. And there is something about, you know, the combination of Sydney, this sort of first time actor who was 
kind of always very vulnerable on set because she had never done this before. And I kind of scooped her up off Facebook and brought her to New York to do the movie. And she felt very far from home and in some ways overwhelmed by the production and, you know, was very confident in her performance, but like a little like, what am I doing here? Like always a little lost about how she ended up in a movie. Um, I don't know, there was like a, there was a chemistry between them and to sort of rehearse the scene. Like I spent a lot of time workshopping it with the counselor and marrying what she does in real life with the style of writing of the script. Um, and then on the day that we shot, I took Sydney to like a quiet room while they lit the set and we just went through it over and over again. And it was a long scene on the page. It was like 15 pages, 10 pages. And Sydney was like a little nervous because she knew we were doing it all in this long take. And there were two cameras on her. One was very close and they were sort of pinning her in the chair almost. And that intensified things. <clears throat> um, but at the beginning of the scene, I told her, I was like, you know, just forget about what the character says. And you can just answer as yourself, like all the families about your, all the questions about your family history and, you know, wearing a seatbelt and stroke or heart disease and all that stuff. Just answer as Sydney and only remember really up to here, from here to here. And there was something about, you know, you never know what's going to work as a director. You just kind of throw things, you know, at moments. And there was something about, having her begin answering from a very personal place of Sydney. Do you smoke? Like, yeah, Sydney smokes a lot, <laughs> you know, and, you know, just answering from herself at the beginning of the scene. And then when she switches into the, to the scripted dialogue, it's seamless because she began mm -hmm. a perfect in such a personal place. Um, yeah. I, you know, I don't know what Sydney was drawing on in those moments, you know, but obviously, you know, that's the actor's craft. Right. And I mean, this is also the second film that um, Hélène Louvard shoots, mm -hmm. right? She's, she was your DP for Beach Rat as mm -hmm. well. How, can you describe your collaboration with, with her? How, what, like, do you incorporate her in this, uh, in the, in the, crafting of the visual language of the film or um yeah what's that yeah like? i think the benefit of working you know together twice and working with the dp again and again is that she knows the language and the grammar you know that i'm working with them so it you know it takes us less time almost to shot list because it's it's the same as writing the script almost you know we do a general pass we do the subjective past, like, well, how are we, how are we experiencing it through the camera? And then we're thinking about all the details that we want to punctuate. It's kind of no different. Writing the shot list and writing the scripts are, are sort of similar processes, I'd say. Um, I really trust Helen and I consider her a key collaborator. Um, like when I was thinking about casting Sydney, it was a, a major risk, you know, to put the weight of this movie on somebody who had no acting ambition. Um, and, you know, I met years and years ago, she didn't even remember me. And, you know, I, she came, comes from a very different world. And, you know, I, I, when when Sydney came down to audition, Helen was in New York, and I I took her out into the world to audition her, like on the train and in Port Authority, and Helen was behind the camera for her audition. Um, you know, we were you know in a way like I think my editor and my DP are sort of closest to my impulses as they take shape. You know, can I can I put the whole movie on this actress? You know, what does she bring? You know, how, you know, how am I going to build the world around her? And I think 
you know, Helene is very close to those key decisions. And I think, you know, a, you know, a good DP is like really in the worlds of the director, in the head of the director. Um, and of course is bringing things also, but you know, is, I don't know how to describe it. Um, I feel, you know, very much like she's a partner in crime in a way. You know, like I knew that Sydney would not do well in an audition room because she doesn't know how to audition. So I, it was like, Helen, you know, we have to do something else. We have to audition her in another way. And then we can spy her to figure out, you know, she, she, she knows that, you know, the pressures around the director in a way and is very much an ally. And um, Jason and I were actually talking about this. Um, I, I would say it's a character in the film but the objects, you know, the suitcase in the film, this, this cumbersome suitcase. And, you know, I, I, we talked about the rubber band, but also like there's this little of like the paper clip that she plays with the store-bought uh, pregnancy test. Mm -hmm. Like these objects have such a presence in the film. And um, yeah, like, how do you think of those elements in, mm -hmm. in relation to the narrative? Yeah, I think, um... I had read a bunch of articles about abortion tourism and like women who come to New York for abortions. And one article in like New York Mag from a decade ago said that they always overpack. You know, that there's this sort of false sense of this, you know, other journey, this other trip that never happens. Um, and there was something about that image of overpacking that really obviously stuck in my head as a metaphor for, you know, the burden that these girls drag, along, drag around in dealing, you know, with these issues alone. Um, so that was sort of the genesis of that idea. Um, I'm also looking at the questions. <coughs> yeah, so there's a question about the um, design of the, the dude. Uh -huh. uh, I think his name is Jasper. The, no. the, so um, the decision to not make him like the stereotypical guy that victimizes the girls. Mm -hmm. how, how? how did I? Um, yeah, I think, you know, the char that character came from a bus trip that I took from Pennsylvania to New York. And I, I saw a kid on the bus with like really expensive earphones and he got on in New Jersey. And I watched him before he got on the bus take money from his dad. So it was like, I was having like a little kind of choose your own adventure. And I'm sort of like, well, what happens if this guy talks to these girls on the bus? Um, and yeah, I mean, I think for me, again, it's kind of about those gray zones in a way, you know, he's, he's relentless and, you know, his charm can go either way, you know, it could either be accepted or rejected, but there's this sort of underlying relentlessness to young men, you know, who think that they're charming. And I think, I think a lot of the characters that I write, you know, fall into that gray zone, you know, of not, not being heroes or not being villains. And I'm just trying to, you know, talk about something else, you know, and, you know, why, why, you know, we can now look at that behavior through a new lens, you know, it is sort of predatory, it is relentless, it is unwelcome, but he pushes through it, you know, and why, you know, like, why, why does he have permission? Because he's handsome, you know, because underlying you know because he's not a rapist does that give him permission to kind of push through it um but he doesn't pick up on her cues you know on the bus in the beginning and she can't shake him um so yeah you know i think i'm always trying to sort of find the gray zone between good and bad and I think the way you set up that scene is also that he bursts their little bubble of mm -hmm. intimacy on the bus, um, along with, I would say, the calls from the woman from the mm -hmm. uh, test, testing center, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's the other kind of stalking mm -hmm. force that happens in the early early part of the, mm -hmm. of the film. Yeah. Those women are known to really 
harassed women who have come in. Mm. Um, and I also went to those clinics to research centers to run to research that film. You know, they're not medically licensed in any way. And I went through many of those counseling sessions just to have a feeling for who they are and what they do and why. And the idea that, you know, there was such a um, distortion of how many weeks pregnant she mm -hmm. is, is that intentional? Like, is that an intentional campaign of misinformation that happens in these kinds of clinics where they- I left it ambiguous, you know, because I didn't want to um, give too much away, but those clinics, you know, it's twofold. You know, they are known for not having licensed doctors, you know, their equipment isn't calibrated. The sonogram technician is a volunteer, you know? So um, there, there is a lot of misinformation that comes out of those experiences and, you know, they have another agenda. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they, so I just, for, yeah, narrowing for, for lying to women about where they are in their pregnancies. I, I just want to look at the questions here um, yeah, yeah, from the audience. I, th I think, well, there's a question about who you're influenced, what filmmakers have influenced you? Mm -hmm. um, I think, I, you know, there's a, a, you know, a long, long list of people who have influenced me. I think like directly on this film, I was thinking a lot about A Man Escaped, the Brisson film. And thinking about, you know, sort of his films have like sort of two cycles, you know, they're either about characters that are breaking free, you know, or characters that are kind of digging their own graves in a way. And um, I was I was thinking about like how in A Man Escaped, you watch someone escape from a prison, you know, and it's this very tactile journey. Um, I was thinking about that. And I was thinking about Romanian new wave films, obviously, and, there was, you know, some revisiting of Ken Loach films and um, I don't know, a lot, a lot of different things. I rewatched Lady Bird, Lady Bird. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was thinking of the Bresson film too, because just the way you use close-ups too of that, you know, the extreme close-ups of the hand, you know, Jasper touching, tapping mm -hmm. her on the on the back in the mm -hmm. bus and the pinkies holding like just the the language and gestures that mm -hmm. happens in the film. Uh, there's another question about how focus features got involved um, after the shooting and if you can describe any changes that were made to, to the film at that point. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think it was sort of in the process, all of that was coming together. Um, there. You know, I, I think it, a lot of people read the scripts, you know, when you make a movie and you go out to actors and you start the casting process, your script is sort of consumed by the whole industry. Um, and there was one really, really lovely young female exec at Focus who had been tracking my work and she read it and loved it. and had spent many years of focus unsuccessfully trying to get, you know, movies made, um, you know, that weren't by, you know, sort of conventional, you know, male directors. And she was so passionate about the project that she had everyone read it within a couple hours. Um, and it was a, you know, a negative pickup deal, which is different than financing the movie. I don't know, it's not worth going into, but they didn't finance the movie. They essentially bought the movie right after it wrapped production. Um, in the in the editing of the movie, it was, it was very light in terms of their feedback. Um, and we went through maybe one round of notes. Um, and, you know, some, like most of their notes were really about calibrating moments of the microaggressions, you know, it's about finding the level, you know, and something, mm -hmm. you know, we're a little bit too, went too far, we're too long. And that was kind of it. It was, I have to say, it was micro for, for studio notes. Um, so from a 
creative standpoint, you know, it was, you know, I guess it went as as well as it could have. I obviously didn't make a commercial movie that they thought they could make a lot of money on, and that's like a separate conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and I mean, given the pandemic, yeah. I know that, you know, you have experienced a kind of unprecedented release for a film. And I was, I was wondering how the experience has been and, you know, maybe the, like the festival audiences that you have encountered has, have you discovered something about your own film through kind of seeing how audiences have reacted or, or, or even in this weird online process of interacting with people um that maybe you didn't know yeah, i mean it's not the same obviously it'll never be the same as like seeing it play and feeling the energy of the audience and having people stop you afterwards like when we screened at sundance you know there were a lot of people who would come up to me afterwards and say hey i'm from utah and i want to tell you about what my you know sister went through or you know, and that, that part of it is really moving, um, is to, you know, hear all these stories from people who never really had an outlet to tell, to talk about their experiences, even if it didn't happen directly to them. Um, yeah, and like my DM box is, you know, sort of filled with nice messages from people, you know, someone saying, oh, you know, I, I went to pencil. I went to college in Pennsylvania, and I saw your movie and was blown away because I drove my friend, you know, to Pittsburgh to get an abortion when her boyfriend was completely MIA. Um, and it, you know, I think it's interesting that it doesn't just, you know, um, create a response from women that you know men are you know tied to these narratives also and hearing from you know uh an array of people obviously makes it more meaningful that i didn't just make a niche film for young women and i mean given that kind of contentious uh, nature of the topic of abortion have you also mm -hmm. encountered negative reactions from from people um not i mean i think i maybe we would have if i had been more out in the world but online stuff sort of protects you i think from a certain kind of audience negativity and how much did the kind of background noise of the political situation play into the actual the writing of the of the film well, it's interesting. I, I started working on the movie, you know, in, in an Obama era. Um, so I would go out pitching it and talking about it loosely, you know, and people, you know, didn't really see the relevance of it. And then all of a sudden, right when, you know, Trump was inaugurated four years ago, all of a sudden the conversation on about access you know, became something people were more aware of. But I couldn't make the movie in um, under Obama's, you know, office, I have to be honest. You know, people didn't think it was a pressing issue, even though not so much is different. You know, we just knew yeah. that Trump was, you know, attempting to roll back the rights. Um, and, you know, and, you know, there's defunding, obviously, that's happened, but um, still not so easy to get, you know, access to care in certain states in you know, country then. Yeah, I noticed actually in some of the frames where you see the little figurine of Trump in that one of the, um, the Act Port Authority. Is that like? Yeah. I, I was wondering if that was like in Near the intentional. The no, no. So um, I think, are we, are we approaching wrapping up? Uh, I th I'm getting a message that we should wrap up uh, soon, but. Um, Thank you, everybody. Um, I'll, I'll just say, I think, uh, I'll say one more thing. 
Um, the abortion rights protesters are terrifying, yet they were, th that's a real protest. Um, it's a monthly permitted protest that happens outside of the Planned Parenthood in New York on Bleecker Street. And I, you know, we, we had scouted it the month before we were shooting and there were only a handful of people there. And then on the day that we showed up, it was massive, um, but it wasn't state. It was something, it was an unexpected gift, I would say, yeah. But I like that it still feels, pro, you know, it still feels peaceful in a way um, and is not, again, it, it falls into that gray zone, you know, they're not shouting obscenities and they're not, you know, they're actually, they're praying and they come after church. So again, it's a, you know, it's about that space between sort of good and evil. Well, I, I want to say thank you to you both. This conversation was wonderful. My camera's not turning off, but I'm still here at the studio and this is Jason and Eliza, the film is so powerful. Is there a way that we can um, help get the word out other than just telling everyone we know, which I've already been doing for? Okay, good, good. And, and um, when uh, this global pandemic ends and life returns to whatever next passes for normal, we would your, the invitation for you to come to Santa Fe is open. We would love to have you here, and we'll show everything you made and have more conversations. It's just we're big fans of your work and um, really no appreciate worries. all that you Thank do. Thank you. I would be honored to come. And I was, and I. No, that's all. Oh, I'm sorry. Saying. Go ahead. Thank you. you were going to say you have you have a family history here in New Mexico too. Yeah, apparently. my dad went to graduate school at the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque. Uh, really? So I've been a couple times just to walk through the campus with him. And it's a beautiful, beautiful place. And Santa Fe is maybe even slightly nicer than Albuquerque. At least yeah. people here would believe that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I I was I I was. In, I was um, neglectful and not thanking and honoring our partners, the National Organization for Women, which helps us put on a monthly film series. We've done it for years in the cinemas. We're doing it now virtually. Um, as soon as I saw this film, I, you know, that same day I texted our partners and said, when this film comes out, we have to do it together because it's just so powerful and perfect for, um, perfectly represents all the work that they do. Um, now is also gonna be part of the conversation on Friday. Bridget Amiri is um, one of the nation's leading um, reproductive rights um, attorneys and she'll be with us on Friday. So please join us then. Mara Fortes, it's so great to see you. Thanks for, for doing all of this. Eliza, we'll see you hopefully in Santa Fe soon. Everyone else, we'll see you on Friday and ongoing um, in the living room. Thank you for being here and have a great night.